Good evening all and welcome very, very much to this event for the York Festival of Ideas. My name is Emily Brunston and I am very privileged to chair tonight's session with our author, Jamie Green. So as I say, it's my great pleasure and great privilege to introduce today's speaker. Um, I've got a lovely little blurb um, to tell you about Jamie. So Jamie Green is a science writer, essayist, editor and teacher, series editor of the best American science and nature writing, she received her MFA in Creative Nonfiction from Columbia, USA, and her writing has appeared in Slate, Popular Science, The New York Times Book Review, American Theatre, Catapult, Astrobytes, and elsewhere. And of course, tonight we are going to learn a lot more about her amazing book, which I'm so fortunate to have a copy of here called Possibility of Life. And I'm going to absolutely commandeer the first couple of seconds here before Jamie speaks to tell you what my opinion is of the book. So as an astronomer, I think that this is a great book because it connects us between the science and the humanity, which is sometimes something we can forget a little bit. You can go sort of down the road of science and what we are learning about in terms of life in the universe, but to then connect that back to the real thoughts, the big questions and how we think about those as humankind, I think is really insightful and quite unique to this type of writing. So I was enthralled actually even as a semi-science specialist in this area to read the book so that's my personal kind of I guess book review but um to waste no more time I think before inviting Jamie to speak uh, about her amazing insights into the possibility of life I'll let Jamie take it away right now thank you so much um yeah so my book is called The Possibility of Life. I published it with Duckworth last year. And um, I wrote this book because I've always, my whole life, been interested in the possibility of alien life, life on other worlds. I am not a scientist. I come at this from a writer. But um, I've just always been fascinated by this question. But then when you go to the bookshelf to try to read about it, what you see are lots of books that treat this as a question of whether or not is there life is there not life what are the odds is it likely is it rare when are we going to find it how are we going to find it um trying to answer questions that honestly we just don't have the ability to answer yet and those answers when we get them will be amazing but until then trying to make guesses without the ability to actually answer anything doesn't really get us anywhere. And so in this book, I decided to approach things differently, um, to approach it instead of a question of whether or not as a question of what if, opening up the possibilities, looking at the different ways the questions might play out, and also what those questions mean. Because thinking about life on Earth, um, life on other planets, and life on Earth a little bit, as you'll see at the end, um, is very much an imaginative project and that imagination is happening both in science and in science fiction so in the book i bring together the science and the science fiction to look at how they influence each other how science fiction um, sort of activates and manifests scientific ideas tests them out testing out the possibilities and then looking at what all of those different possibilities can tell us about what this search means and what life on earth means because with all of that science this is still the one example that we have but we have lots of other examples through fiction and that's where we have them until we maybe maybe not who knows find something beyond so today i'm going to be talking through some of those ideas this is adapted from a few different sections of the book um just looking at how a couple of scientific ideas interplay with fictional imaginings and, and what that all adds up to. Let me actually click into my slides. There we go. So um, to start in the absolutely most cliched way that as a writing teacher, I would put a big X through on any one of my students' papers. Since the dawn of time, Humans have wondered about other beings, and we've imagined other beings, whether that's gods, angels, demons, monsters, ghosts, imagining spirits into rocks and rivers and clouds. We've always populated our cosmos with other beings. And I think a lot of this is ways of making sense 
of our place in the world, creating more of a sense of context so that we don't, whether we're right or wrong, feel as alone as the only sentient creatures. Um, but for millennia, at least in Western culture, in Western civilization, sort of tracing back to the ancient Greeks, we actually weren't able to imagine life on other worlds because the dominant worldview, the dominant view of the cosmos didn't have other worlds in it. It was like this. It was the geocentric model where the earth is at the center and it is orbited by the sun and the moon and the planets and beyond the planets, the sphere of the stars. But the planets here were just points of light, just like the stars, you know, with your naked eye, you can see that they're different from stars. They don't twinkle and they move differently, which is why they're not on the big celestial sphere that's in the background. But no one had any inkling that they were other worlds. And this was the entrenched worldview in Western culture for millennia, thanks mainly to Aristotle. Aristotle is the one who, um, sort of built this worldview and advocated for it. There were other views of the cosmos in ancient Greece, but this really had a stranglehold on Western culture for millennia. And it wasn't because it was so scientifically great. Like, yes, in the, you know, broadest strokes, um, it matches what you see standing on the surface of the earth. We are standing still. Everything seems to move around us. But for Aristotle, the geocentric model was much more about um, its philosophical utility, the way that it manifested his physics. Scientifically, as a model for like explaining and predicting how things move in the sky, it's actually not great. And it gets really convoluted. So one way was eventually in order to match the model as well as possible to the observations of the planets and the stars moving in the sky you had to do this which is the celestial bodies other than the sun aren't orbiting the earth they're on these things called epicycles where the planet is orbiting a sort of imaginary point on the orbital circle this um, accounts, for example, for the fact that sometimes planets have what's called retrograde motion in the sky. We've all heard about Mercury retrograde. They all do it. Sometimes the planets move with the direction of the stars. Sometimes they move against it. And this was the sort of awkward way of explaining it. And even still, the model was never perfect. And so for millennia, from Aristotle through to the Renaissance, because the model stuck around because of its philosophical utility. I mean, who's going to love the Earth being at the center of the solar system, the Earth being at the center of the cosmos more than the Catholic Church, right? We are central to God's creation, a very philosophically useful cosmology. But scientifically, it had all these little tweaks. There were different versions of it trying to make it fit observations, but it never quite worked. You know, a planet by the model would be predicted to show up in the sky or rise at a certain place and time, and it never quite worked. So this model was eventually doomed. And there were lots of broad cultural forces that made it possible, both cultural and scientific advances that made it possible to dethrone this worldview. But we attribute it mainly to the work of two men, um, and they are Copernicus and Galileo. So Copernicus approached revising the geocentric model as a scientific mathematic problem. The model didn't work. He wanted to make it work. And I don't know if he anticipated that what he was actually going to have to do in order to get the math and the science to match the observations was come up with an entirely new worldview. In this case, the heliocentric model of the solar system, which, as you know, is where the sun actually is. And once you reorient things like this, this really radical revision of the worldview, things fall into place a lot better. Still not perfect, but really, really close. But that's a huge conceptual change, saying that the Earth is not central. The Earth is not special. The Earth is orbiting the sun, like just a very dramatic shift in our understanding, both of astronomy and physics and of like what we mean. The second important nail in the coffin of the geocentric model 
was observational. And this came from Galileo and his advances in telescopes. And for the first time, he was able to observe the planets in more detail than just really a point of light in the sky. And so he observed Saturn's rings, for example, that's the one that looks like a donut. And most importantly for this, he observed the phases of Venus. And that was what revealed that Venus and the other planets were spheres, which meant that they were worlds just like the Earth. And that is when this imaginative real estate opens up, when all of a sudden you have the idea of, okay, the Earth is a world, and so are all of these planets, and we're not central, we're a planet just like the others. So if we are the same as them, and they're the same as us, there should be life on those other worlds. And from there, you're off to the races. You have astronomers, philosophers, writers who in these times were often just the same guy, um, imagining what life might be like on these other worlds. And this is really a way of it's not just like, oh, I've got new stories that I can tell. Let's open up a new shelf at Barnes and Noble. It's a way of processing and making sense of these really radical scientific changes through storytelling, through human experience, through narrative. The first world, I'm going to pause for a second and cough. The first world that um, was sort of imaginatively populated was the moon. It's close, it's easy to see in detail. Um, and this had been happening a little bit before the Copernican revolution, but it really was off to the races and much more about imagining realistic views of what a society, what a biosphere on another world might be. Whereas before the Copernican revolution, it was the moon and the sun were used more for like settings for satire. It didn't have to do with the actual moon, but now it did. And one of the first examples here, which you could call the first example of science fiction, I know that that's a very contentious, is it Frankenstein, is it this, is it that, you could say that it's this work Somnium by Johannes Kepler. And yes, it's the same Kepler you're thinking of, a vitally important Renaissance astronomer who his main contribution to the Copernican model was he was the one who figured out that the orbits of the planets are not perfect spheres as Copernicus still believed. The, Math won't work out that way. They're ellipses. And that was actually that was actually philosophically very important, sort of getting away from this idea of perfection in the spheres. But Copernicus also wrote this story called Somnium, which means a dream. And I'm going to read this from my notes because it's very convoluted. So in Somnium, the narrator dreams that he is reading a book. And in the book, a spirit from the moon comes and talks about what life is like on the moon. So it's it's very, it's a Matryoshka doll of, of fiction. Um, and what is on the moon is just like life on earth. There are plants and animals and people. And one of the most interesting things to me is that it goes into great detail about what the society is like on the moon. So it's not just scientific, but it's also sociological. And Kepler imagines that the society on the side of the moon facing the earth is very different from the dark side, which does get sunlight, but is doesn't have this big steady planet hanging in the sky. Um, and so we see there in this earliest work, the, the beginnings of something that continues through to the present day in science fiction, of not only using science fiction to inhabit and explore scientific ideas, but to test out cultural possibilities beyond what's on earth. You know, this ongoing quest to give ourselves context and perspective from outside of ourselves. Um, about a decade after Somnium, an English bishop named Francis Godwin wrote a book or a story about a man who, as you can see here, is carried to the moon by a flock of geese, naturally. Um, and he describes their <clears throat> he describes there a sort of supersized version of life on Earth. This is a way of processing again the scientific information because early observations of the moon um, made it look like the moon's mountains were much higher than Earth's mountains. And so through this idea of it's sort of proportional, supersized geography, supersized life. So everything on there is bigger. It's just, you know, 
testing out these possibilities. Um, and so from then on through maybe the turn of the 20th century, it's just this period of great imaginative abundance of imagining all of these different worlds and imagining the cosmos as densely, densely populated. All of a sudden, we're not alone. Um, in around the turn of the 19th century, one astronomer speculated that sunspots, which were newly discovered, were holes in the sun's hot surface showing a cool dark interior which would be inhabited um in the 1830s an, an amateur astronomer did some math and suggested that saturn's rings should be home to about eight million beings and this is also fascinating in the context of religion which i'm not going to get hugely into here but in some cases the co the huge inhabited cosmos makes humanity feel insignificant? Are we no longer God's special chosen ones? Or is God's creation even vaster and more abundant than we could have imagined? Um, a, a proponent of that second view was the French astronomer Camille Flammarion, and I who also, like Kepler, wrote some imaginative fiction. But I love this line of his about the creatures of the cosmos. Shall we greet them? My brothers, let us all greet them. Those are our sister humanities passing by. So just this idea of kinship and extended community beyond Earth. It's not all kinship and sister humanities. You know, um, we get the beginnings of the trope of Martian invasion with the War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Um, and a sister work that I'm not gonna get into here from Germany, but here we get the idea of aliens, not as our comrades, but as our conquistadors, as our, you know, as conquest. Um, and the idea of Martians being more advanced than humans actually also has its roots in science. Darwin, the idea of evolution from Darwin was very influential to astronomers, not just for thinking about life on other worlds, but for thinking about planet formation. Um, around the end of the 19th century, there was the idea that planets sort of coalesced farther out from their stars first and then in and in. So that would mean that the outermost planets are older, the innermost planets are younger. So if Mars is older than Earth, and we add that to the idea of Darwinian evolution, then life on Mars would be more advanced than life on Earth. And that's what's manifesting here in the War of the Worlds. But again, it's never just science, it's also culture. And so what's also manifesting in War of the Worlds is grappling with the human history and especially the Western and European history of conquest and colonialism. This again carries through contemporary science fiction. You also see it playing out in really interesting ways um, in, sci in science fiction from Africa and Latin America, places with a history of colonialism, grappling and thinking through that. But for white European writers, a lot of it is like, ooh, we did some bad stuff. What if that happened to us? And Wells actually explicitly connects this. He writes in the book, before we judge of the Martians too harshly, we must remember what ruthless and utter destruction of our, our own species has wrought not only upon animals such as the vanished bison and dodo, but upon its own inferior races. And then he goes on to explicitly connect this with like colonialism um, in Tasmania. So we see taking the scientific information, the scientific framework to imagine possibilities, but also imagining different cultural sociological possibilities, um, sort of different ways of if we rewind the tape and play it back, how else, what are the other patterns that life can take? Which eventually brings us to this guy. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause again for a cough and a sip of tea. Thanks for bearing with me on that. So this guy is called Prolemurus and he appears uh, for a split second in the background of a moment in the movie Avatar, directed by James Cameron. And he is a fascinating, you know, I'm gendering him, we don't know. They are a fascinating example of a modern science fiction work trying to build its 
world, in this case, this really dense, complex ecology on evolutionary scientific principles. So this guy looks kind of like a monkey. It's swinging through the trees. You know, you can see it's got long grabby toes on the bottom, but what is up with those arms, right? Like it has six hands, but branching off the arm, it's amazing. I'm going to explain why. And this was brought to my attention by a paleontologist and educator named Katie Slavensky. And I just love this example because if you've seen Avatar, you haven't really noticed Prolomuris, but you have noticed the Navi, right? These are the people of uh, the moon world Pandora. I will, for anyone paying close attention, the, the guy on the left is not actually an Avi. He's an avatar, right? He's this like engineered body inhabited by the psyche of a human. And that is why he has five fingers. You'll notice that um, Neytiri on the right has four fingers and four toes because she's an actual Navi. And I can't believe that writing this book has made me learn so much about avatar. But the, the Navi are, I don't know, like nine feet tall. They're blue. They have tails. They look pretty funky. But their body plan is very human. They have two arms and two legs, and they, you know, are upright. They look like us. But then the creatures of Avatar, especially the land-dwelling creatures, they don't look like that. They look like this or that. And so up top, we've got a predator. Below, we've got a sort of rhino analog. And the big thing to notice here is that they have six limbs, three on each side. Um, and the Navi don't. The people, who I assume are evolved out of the same animal, mammal-ish lineage of these guys, they are the only four-legged creatures that we see on Pandora. And that is weird. And there are lots of reasons why Cameron might have wanted to have four limbed people and six limbed animals. The six limbed animals add the sense of weirdness and alien otherness. Whereas for the people doing all that mocap, it's very hard to CGI in extra sets of limbs. There's also a sense of empathy. You don't want them to be too weird and alien because they're our main characters. So on Earth, We've got four limbed people and all of these animals, like all these vertebrates are tetrapods, four limbed creatures, even that, I think that's a skink, it's not a worm, but we've got amphibians, mammals, birds, reptiles, and people, because we all come from this same vertebrate lineage, have four limbs, it's this tetrapod body plan. And that, it's in evolution, you don't really change a body plan. You have different ones, but like once they're entrenched, you're, you don't evolve extra limbs. You can, you can lose them, obviously the skink, whales, but the bones, it's still in there. The, the lineage is still there. So then how do we get, oh, well, I, you know, how do we get to these guys from this guy? And that is where Prolomuris comes in. And so we can see the six limbed animal the four-limbed person, this is meant to be the missing link. And you can see now that we know that there's like a six-limbed ancestry, those upper and middle, middle limbs are starting to fuse. And there, you know, it's, it's this tiny background creature. And I just love that someone in James Cameron's office was like, we gotta, we gotta build this bridge. Unfortunately, evolutionarily, if you think about it, a monkey-like tree swinging creature would be like the last animal to lose limbs. More limbs, more hands to grab are what's really advantageous for them. Monkeys on earth use their tails as essentially a fifth limb. And it turns out that um, we know through evolution and there's no reason to, this is like a physics thing. So there's no reason to think it wouldn't apply elsewhere. The animals who tend to lose limbs or lose contact with the ground, aside from ones who like go back to live in the ocean like whales, are runners, um, are grazers, are, you know, ground dwelling animals. This going from present day back into the past from top to bottom is the evolution of horse feet. So a horse's hoof is essentially one toe and all the other toes have like, um, not quite atrophied, but become much less pronounced because runners and ground dwelling animals reduce their contact with the ground, whereas a, a tree swinging monkey like Prolomuris would not. But 
This isn't about policing what's right and wrong. It's about looking at what happens when we bring science into science fiction and what you know, the ways that it influences our stories and that those stories influence our understanding of the world. Because this isn't just about the evolution of limbs. There's another evolutionary logic going on here that gives us um, Navi who look like that because we have people who look like that. Because this is a very common thing in aliens. You know, aside from Avatar, we've also got ET, nose, eyes, mouth, neck, shoulders, fingers, right? Very similar, very familiar. Chewbacca, same thing, just hairy. The xenomorph from Alien, one of the spookiest, weirdest aliens. But when you look at its body, you're like, oh, that's just, this is like a guy, like a spooky guy, but our kind of guy. Also Predator, Alien's greatest enemy, even more our kind of guy. The aliens from Mars Attacks, the little dudes from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. This guy from X-Files who might be from a dream sequence, but I love him anyway. John Carter of Mars, uh, Stargate, not Star Trek. You're probably thinking Star Trek fits in here, but no, Star Trek does not. I'm not going to get into why that's in my book. I'm not just saying that to tease it, but really because we don't have time. Um, and also here's the credits for all of those. But for all of these, we see aliens who look very humanoid. And there are lots of reasons for this, right? There's um, empathy for the viewers. There's special effects budgets. But there is also a scientific logic, a scientific argument you can make for intelligent person-like aliens looking a lot like humans, maybe not with, you know, uh, beachy waves and eyeliner and boobs, but head, neck, shoulders, four limbs, all of that. This is the idea of convergent evolution, which is something that we see on Earth. That's what that is, Earth. Um, and convergent evolution is when <clears throat> um, organisms independently evolve the same traits, essentially converging on the same evolutionary solutions to the challenges of the natural environment. Um, a very obvious example is sharks and dolphins independently evolved very similar body structures to solve the problem of swimming in water. Dolphins are mammals. They're much more closely related to camels than sharks, but look how similar their bodies look. Or bats and birds independently evolved winged flight with their forelimbs. Um, octopus eyes and human eyes, which I'm not going to put pictures of because eyeballs are kind of gross, um, independently evolved the same lensed architecture. And it's not just animals. Plants have evolved the ability to um, create caffeine, something like four times. So this is convergent evolution. But it is a huge debate in evolutionary biology as to whether this is the exception or the rule, whether nature tends to end up on the same solutions over and over again, or if these are just catchy, visible examples that are the exception to the rule. This is something that's debated philosophically. It's also something that is investigated experimentally. Um, Jonathan Lossus's book, Improbable Destinies, which is wonderful, gets into the ways that in the wild and in the lab, scientists have tried to ask, as they put it, if you rewound the tape of evolution and played it back, would you end up with the same things? Are these just the best solutions to these problems? Or is this random? And if a butterfly had sneezed 500 million years ago, I don't think butterflies even existed then, I'm not sure, but would humanity look really different? And so that's the, the sort of underpinning of this assumption that aliens on another world would be similar to humans. This is what's going on when you have alien worlds that have green plants and that have plants and that have animals and that have bird type flying things and walking things. And, you know, it's like evolution fills all these niches. Is it going to fill them the same way? And in Improbable Destinies, Lassus gets into, you know, when you take a sort of quadruped, you know, mammal, you take like a horse, a dinosaur, whatever, and think about if it evolved intelligence, what physical changes would it need? Like, 
Do you need to be upright? Do you need um, an upright head for speech? Do you need to be able to walk so that your hands are free? Do you want grabby fingers so that you're dexterous? You can make this argument that so many of the characteristics that we have as humans aren't random but are necessary for being an intelligent creature or is that just our what's familiar clouding our imagination there is also plenty of science fiction although i would guess a bit less that takes the opposite point of view. And instead of imagining alien people converging with humanity, imagines things that are really, really alien. Um, one of the best examples is Arrival or the movie Story of Your Life, or the short story, Story of Your Life, that the movie Arrival was based on. And in both of these, we have these super alien aliens with seven limbs and eyes all around their body so they don't have a front or a back where like every almost every animal every vertebrate and bugs fronts and backs are very common on earth right and in arrival that manifests in the ways that the aliens experience the world as well although of course in the movie they zoom out and reveal that it's like basically got a head and shoulders you know like once the alien becomes a character that we're going to identify with and really get to know a little you put the camera right behind him for a two shot. Um, another example is the Mulefa from Philip Pullman's Amber Spyglass from the His Dark Materials book. And I had to look so hard to find, this is, you know, a fan art that doesn't fall into that traps of earthly anatomy. Because here's what's so cool about the Mulefa. I mean, there are a lot of things that are cool about them, but this is sort of a top down view of an earth animal, right? You've got a head, a neck, and limbs at the four corners of the rectangle. And that's a little tail. The Mulefa have a diamond body plan with one limb at the midline in the front and back and then uh, two limbs on the side. And it's just like, this is something that we don't have on earth. Um, there's a whole other very cool evolutionary thing going on where, and yes, this is a parallel reality, not aliens, but close enough. Um, the Mulefa are basically Pullman's way of imagining how could wheeled transport naturally evolve. Um, and he, he has very good logic for it, which I'm not going to get into right now. But so we and, and, and just like in Arrival, in the TV adaptation of this, they make the Mulefa just freaking regular rectangular quadrupeds. I'm so mad. Anyway, um, so we see in science fiction, this sort of divide between the weird, really alien, divergent, intelligent aliens. And the Mulefa are like, they speak, they're sentient, they're people, even though, you know, you can see they've got little hands on the side, they use their trunks for dexterousness and the convergent evolution of all these guys, you know, the human humanoid body plan. And in addition to being a showing us the different sides of the debate around convergent evolution. This also shows us the very pressing question of what's called the Copernican principle. So the Copernican principle is the idea that ever since Copernicus discovery, discovered that the earth is not the center of the solar system, we have just discovered more and more ways in which we are not central and we are not special. The earth is not the center of the solar system. The solar system is not the center of the galaxy. The galaxy is not the entirety of the cosmos. It's just one of many in the universe. The universe may be one of many. We're not at the middle of anything. We're not special. That's it. And so the Copernican principle takes all of that and suggests that, like, don't ever assume that we're special. We tend to find out that we're not. But when we're thinking about alien life, I don't know if us being unique or us being average, I don't know which one plays out the Copernican principle. Like, if we say that we are average, are we assuming that we are the default? And is that at odds with the Copernican principle? Or if we say that we are average, is that exactly what the Copernican principle says? And we shouldn't assume that we're special and being unique or the only ones is what would be special. We don't know. I don't think we'll ever know because we're never going to know everyone who might be out there.
But we're starting to get hints of answers in terms of planets, because that's where we are starting to really get a sense of what's going on beyond our own solar system. Because we, up until wildly recently, didn't know if our solar system was average or was weird. And we didn't even know for sure if there were other planets at all around other stars until 1995 and the discovery of this planet, which is called 51 Pegasi B. And, and ever since then, it's been this flood. We've identified something like 6,000 exoplanets and they're common enough that odds are any star in the sky you point to, it probably has a planet. But what we have discovered is that these planets are not, at least from what we can see so far, a lot like Earth. So here's a little schematic showing you the difference. So at the top, we have the distances of the inner planets from the sun, and then that's how close 51 Peg B is. But it's not a tiny little hot ball of rock like Mercury. It is bigger than Jupiter. Not only is that not what we have in our solar system, but it totally challenged the theories of planet formation that scientists had made based on our solar system. Those theories explained very well how our solar system formed, but there was a lot of other work that had to be done to explain what are these so-called hot Jupiters like Peg B and all sorts of other planets. And so here we have a nice um, collection of artist illustrations of some of the quote unquote Earth-like planets that have been found. Um, but despite what you may see in news headlines, we have not found a single Earth-like planet in terms of composition, size, density, um, orbiting an Earth-like star. A lot of that is the bias of the different detection methods, but we just don't know if, if rocky, solid planets that give life a nice place to be, a good distance from their star so that it's not too hot, not too cold in the so-called Goldilocks zone. We don't know. And that's just, I mean, that brings me back to what I was saying at the beginning, that like there is so much that we don't know. Um, but that doesn't mean that asking these questions and exploring these questions isn't, you know, the most interesting thing in the world, I think, at least. So I'm going to close with this tweet from um, an astrobiologist named Abel Mendez, who I interviewed for my book. He's wonderful. He works in Puerto Rico. Um, and he recently tweeted this. Maybe we are the first or last planet with life in our galaxy. Either way, we are alone. And he said something similar when I interviewed him for my book, I was asking him, you know, what he thought about life on other worlds. And he was like, oh, I don't, I don't really think about that. I don't care. And I was like, well, if you don't care, why do you do this work? And he said, you realize how special Earth is in this process. And so my thinking was now, well, extraterrestrial life is not that interesting to me. Home is your most interesting thing. Um, Abel had started as an astronomer and sort of learned the biology and ecology aspects of astrobiology, and it really brought him into this deeper appreciation of life on Earth through this search for alien life that, as you see, he thinks may be futile. But so then why do you keep searching, I asked him, and he said, because I learned more. From studying all this, I learned more about Earth, and that's what I love. And that's what I think all of these searches can do, the scientific searches, all of the different visions of alien life. Um, yes, they tell us what alien life might be like, but they really are all of these different mirrors and lenses through which to understand the human experience. Um, and later on in that thread, Abel said, we will continue to live and keep searching. And I think that he's right, that it doesn't matter what we find, it matters what questions we ask along the way. Thank you. Wow, Jamie, thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. I hope the audience tonight is along with me and giving you a virtual round of applause. I mean, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to remind everyone who's with us here live tonight that you can ask your questions for Jamie. We've got some time. We've got nearly 20 minutes, which is amazing, to talk to you um, about everything that's in your book and everything you've mentioned tonight and beyond. Um, so if you do have questions, please drop to the Q&A button and pop them in there. At this point, I'm going to totally abuse my privilege as the chair and actually ask my own question first, because 
I'm allowed to do that. Um, even though I've seen there's a couple of group ones that, um, coming in as well. But I'm going to ask, this is coming from myself, I guess, as a scientist. There's quite a, a shift, I think, when you look at the history that you talk about in your book, about how early scientists really thought about the philosophy of what they were doing in the science. Mm -hmm. They wrote about what they were doing and they wrote about what they imagined because of the science. Somewhere along the way that changed. And maybe it was almost to be more credible as a scientist, you had to stop being creative and imaginative. And I wondered what your thoughts were now. I mean, is that still true or does, does that need to maybe move a different direction? I think it is and it isn't. I think that it's largely a product of specialization within science, the professionalization of science. We, th we see this in biology too, that you used to be able to be just sort of like a gentleman naturalist you know, and um, there's actually a book, oh my gosh, it's called Unrooted. Um, it's about botany that came out last year. And it goes into, in part, the the way that gender dynamics played out in the professionalization of botany. But I think that's true across the field. You know, this is a gender thing. This is also a sort of pr general professionalization where um, sort of, you know, who was doing what people stopped sort of doing, there was more focus. But we also look at one of the most influential and important um, astronomers and science communicators of the last century, Carl Sagan wrote novels, or he wrote a novel and was going to write more. Unfortunately, he died younger than we wish, but he wrote one of the most important science fiction novels of the second half of the 20th century in Contact, um, which hugely shaped the public imagination in terms of SETI and the search for life and and all of that and is also just like a really great book and a great movie. So I think that there is still room for that. They are more separated. It's not it's not all tied up in it and it is probably a bit more unu more unusual. There's also just like the academic funding method where it's like who has time with all of the, you know, research and grant writing and committees and all of that like so it's just the sort of professional specialization of the field brilliant but it's nice that i guess books like yours then help bridge that really and bring that together in a really accessible way cool so i'm going to turn to some of our um, questions from our people here live with us tonight so the first one i'm going to ask is actually from joseph and i think it's a nice question because this is something that certainly i come across a bit from time to time. So after the publication of your book, is there any story you wish you had included or that you came across afterwards that you would include in a future book? There is, and now I can't remember it. Oh my God, what was it? I We can, we can such put a pin on it if you like. And, and I'll see back. if it comes back to me. Man. It's such a good question. No one has asked me that question before. And I remember that feeling of encountering something and being like, oh God, this would be so good. But you just sort of want to be able to keep writing and keep writing and you just have to stop eventually. Um, but I'll see if I'll see if it comes back to me. Okay. That's cool. Well, we can we can circle back on that one if you okay. see it in the rest of the so the next one, this is a slightly more technical one about um from an anonymous attendee about convergent evolution. And I like this because it links an to directly what you were saying. So the question is, I'll, 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 I'll read it directly so I don't mess it up. Convergent evolution, or could it be that we lack the imagination to truly imagine something different as life? Would we recognize life if it was so different? I mean, yes, that is a fascinating and pressing question in terms of especially the search for life elsewhere in the solar system, on Mars, on the moons of the gas giants. Um, I do think that that is a real challenge in the field of life detection. I think if something were macro scale, had a little tentacle to wave at us, you know, yeah, we would recognize that at li as life. But in terms of cellular microbial life, in terms of recognizing life by its chemistry rather than by its physiology, I think that that is a, a big challenge. Um, we even see historically with the Viking landers on Mars in the 70s, which were the first landers on Mars, they're the only American Mars mission so far that has literally tried to do life detection instead of trying to detect water or sort of the 
circumstances for life that had actual life detection experiments on board and the results were inconclusive the results were weird the results didn't match what we expected to see for life but they weren't nothing either and similarly like the the question of convergence in chemistry in life chemistry is also really interesting. You know, I alluded briefly to the idea of the habitable zone, the, the place in orbit, the distance from a star where a planet is not too hot, not too cold. That's so you can have liquid water, which is thought to be a prerequisite for life. Is that narrow-minded? I actually think that's pretty reasonable. Um, liquids and water, especially water is like a really special molecule does a lot of things that seem to be important for not just our biochemistry, but like any, chemistry that's fast enough and complicated enough to carry the information of life. Um, but beyond that, the, you know, being carbon based, having DNA, having DNA built out of the things that our DNA is built out of, like, we don't know what is just the best way to do it that any life might end up with or where the alternatives, the, the viable alternatives start branching off. And so for life detection, when you're dealing with chemical signatures, as opposed to someone saying, take me to your leader or slithering along the ground, that is a very, very uh, fraught question. Yeah, my mind is drawn to, I think a couple of years ago when we detected phosphine on Venus. I don't know if you remember. Yes. And then it became very reductionist very quickly that there must be penguins on Venus producing phosphine. Right. It was a very strange. Well, and that narrative. also, that that is such a fascinating situation to me because the detection of the phosphine was even debatable because it wasn't like we took a scoop of Venus and we said, oh, look, there's phosphine or that we took a picture and we saw it. It was deep interpretation of the data. Um, and that was actually part of part of the problem there. It wasn't does phosphine mean life? We didn't even get that far because it was like there might not actually be phosphine there. And so when we go outside the solar system, it's even harder because we're dealing with spectra of the light reflecting off an atmosphere or passing through an atmosphere and then making our inferences about would that go along with life on Earth? Would that go along with life on that planet? What do we know of its chemistry? I mean, what we know of exoplanets is really, really small. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a lovely way to, I guess, think of the possibilities, but not be too specific to think about penguins. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got a nice question here from, um, from Kang. Um, this is a slightly, I mean, obviously more in your sort of science fiction um, sort of boundary. They're looking for a little clue, maybe just a little clue so that they can pick it up in your book as to why you excluded Star Trek from your discussion about different humanoids. So for the most part, it seems like Star Trek is working on the idea of convergent evolution, where we have many, the main character races, you know, humans, Vulcans, Romulans, Klingons, Cardassians, whoever else. Um, look like people and there are practical reasons for that you know um mostly special effects reasons and especially once you get into like next generation you get lots of non-humanoid non-material non-carbon based also in um the original series so star trek is not narrow-minded but star trek also um on an episode of Next Generation, it's the first thing in my book, so you don't even have to read the whole book to get it, but they create an in-world reason for all of these humanoid races um, that I think is, is very interesting, and it's very interesting that they did that. I'll leave it there. No, that's fantastic. So I get, we, we're jumping around with these questions. We've got, we've got quite yeah. amazing questions, but I'm going to jump around in, in themes a bit. Um, so I'm going to ask a question from Natalie, which I think I, I actually share this question. How do you think philosophy and our understanding of what it means to be human would be impacted by discovering that there is life in the universe versus finding out we're alone? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, first of all, we're never going to be able to know that we're alone. We will never know that there isn't life that we haven't detected, that we haven't been able to find. Our ability to detect it is pretty much constrained to our galaxy. There's so much more than that, you know, um, but even still, we're never going to be able to, you know, look under every rock. So we'll never know that we're alone. Um, finding out that we're not alone, I think it really depends what 
form that takes? You know, is it a chemical signature of a microbe? Is it a signal? Is it a visitation as unlikely as that is? Um, you know, and I think for me that goes from more possible to least to less likely. Um, I think that we're much more likely to find microbial life than multicellular life. And I don't know that microbial life would have much to tell us about our context. I don't, you know, it's not like we feel this deep kinship with bacteria. And so having a new kind of alien bacteria, what would that change? Um, I do think that if we, like what so much of sci-fi and, this, and the, the hunger for finding intelligent life elsewhere is about, is about having any sort of context within which to understand ourselves. How do we compare to what there is? And this is a thing that is very present in Star Trek, very present in a lot of science fiction where you have different types. So in Star Trek, you have the, you know, very, the warlike and uh, emotional, volatile Klingons, the logical, cold, Vulcans, the logical, cold, mean Romulans, you know, and so we sort of set humanity on a spectrum within them. Um, this comes up in contact also in the sort of climactic scene where I'm going to spoil contact because it's very old at this point, um, but where Ellie Arroway meets the alien in the form of her father, he tells her what he sees of humanity, you know, um, what our strengths and weaknesses are, how we compare to the other life out there. And I think that is something that we really hunger for to know, like, like to take a, a, a personality test for the whole species, you know, like, are we inherently violent because it's also a way of making sense of what we see on earth you know like are we inherently generous and altruistic and we sometimes get led astray or do we just really suck and we keep doing bad things to the planet <laughs> like both of those things are true and so how do we understand what it means to be human when we have no other context no context within which to understand that I mean, these are massive questions, and I think you could probably write books on each one of those. Yeah, those ones. But yeah, it's huge, isn't it? It's absolutely yeah. Cool. Sidestepping a little bit again, because again, yeah. this is a, a nice um, question. So this one's from I Hughes. What was your writing process and writing routine to create this book? It was it was hard. Um, because like like you were saying before about those big questions like every chapter of this book could be its own book um for better or for worse so i i wrote this book almost entirely during the first couple of years of the pandemic um like i had one research trip for it in january of 2020 and then everything else all of my interviews were over zoom and that actually shaped the book a lot because it meant that i didn't end up with that sort of traditional um science writing structure of, you know, the chapter opens and I'm in a lab and I'm talking to the scientists and they're wearing a colorful Hawaiian shirt and they show me the bug that they do research on. And then I hold the bug and I look at it and then there's a section break and I start talking about the science, right? I just like could not do that. I just had these hour long talking head interviews. And in terms of the writing, that I think made the book much more essayistic, made it much more about thinking through ideas. The scenes that you have in the book come from sci-fi, right? Like I'm describing moments and scenes in sci-fi rather than me reporting it. And so I'm there thinking, but not like, because I'm not in the alien world. Um, so I had a lot of conversations with scientists because I also, like you were saying, Emily, earlier that you know, there's not as much speculation in science anymore. I was asking them to say things that don't end up in research papers. It's like, okay, but like, if you really imagine, like, like go out on a limb, what do you think? You know, that kind of stuff that just is not in the scientific literature. Um, and then I also was reading a lot of sci-fi. Of the sci-fi in the book, I would guess it's about a 50-50 mix between books and movies that I knew before I started working on this book that were some of the inspiration for writing this book. Like, I always knew that Sue Burke's book, Semiosis, would be in here. I knew Mary Daria Russell's The Sparrow would be in here. I knew Contact would be in here. I knew a lot of Star Trek would be in here. But then reading lots of sci-fi that 
tackled the questions that I'm looking at in the book. You know, what would life be like on a planet that orbited differently? Um, what are some of the interesting possibilities for alien language and linguistics um, or for biology and ways of being? And so just reading a lot of sci-fi and just trying to find books that had an interesting point of view or an interesting take or interesting insights into these scientific questions that are all questions we need to answer in order to understand who or what might be out there. That's fabulous. Um, we do have lots of questions. I'm sorry if we don't get to all the questions. Uh, we will pass those on to Jamie, though, um, so that you yeah, can... and you're welcome to like oh, come tweet come tweet at me if you want and just or on Instagram or whatever. That's where I am, and I will I will brilliant. answer more questions for sure. Thank you, thank you. But I am going to push you, and I'm going to ask one last question, okay. and it's probably the one that you don't really want to answer. So, it's <laughs> okay. Time. All right, right here, right now. Do you think that there is life elsewhere in the universe? I think there is probably microbial life. I think there is simple life. Um, I think that um, complex multicellular life is probably extremely, extremely rare. Um, and I, I get into why in the book, but it has to do with the evolution of life on earth. It's life on earth started just about as soon as conditions made it possible. Like we stopped being bombarded or maybe we still were. And then all of a sudden, you know, chemistry got interesting. And then it was 2 billion years before there were any structural changes in the, in the first cells. And that's the change from, um, Bacteria and archaea, which are simple cells, they don't have a nucleus or a lot of internal structure, to um, eukaryotic cells, which are what are in us, which are cells with a nucleus. And that leap seems like it might have been a real fluke. And we don't know. And I think that's a fascinating question. But that, to me, is the pessimism line. But yeah, no, I, I often ask my colleagues the same question. So it's interesting to, to get the full range of responses. Yeah. That's a really interesting thought. So we are going to start to wrap up there. I'm going to show you again my wonderful copy of The Possibility of Life. And if you haven't got one yet, don't worry, it is available. You can go out and get one. In fact, the our wonderful festival partner, Fox Lane Books, which is at foxlanebooks.co.uk, um, are selling this book so you can go and grab your copy, get some more details, get some more details about the science, the science fiction, the philosophy, all of the things that Jamie's talked about tonight, go and get a real deep dive. It's a nice one to just curl up, I think, fingers crossed, in the summer sunshine. Um, and just think about, you You just have to start, you, I found I had to pause at lots of different points during the book and just stop and think about it and really wrap your head around, I guess, what truly are the biggest questions that we can ask I think as humankind. Yeah. So please join me again to thank Jamie. Um, again, if you're at home clapping away, I'm thank sure you. she can see you all across um, the UK and beyond. If you want to watch a recording of this event, then you can grab that off the Festival of um, Ideas from of the University of York's YouTube channel. Um, you can get it from the watch again part of the festival, but wonderful people who are with us still today can will also get an email link so you can actually hook in straight away and get to see that. Um, otherwise, my final job for this evening is just to all wish you a very, very lovely evening rest of the weekend and thank you once again for Jamie for joining us for such a fascinating talk. Thank you so much Emily. Thanks everyone. Goodbye.